Once the Americans figured out what to look for, they were able to improve everything from port security to Coast Guard patrols, sharply limiting maritime and airborne shipments first into Miami, then all of Florida, and in time all coastal approaches. By the year 2000, maritime smuggling routes may not have been severed, but they had become so fraught with danger that they were no longer viable methods for transporting the bulk of the illicit narcotics the Americans so craved. As of 2014, Miami is still a major point of entry for South American cocaine. Most of it comes through Venezuela and up the Lesser Antilles change to the Dominican Republic and Haiti before making the jump to Puerto Rico, a U.S. territory, or Miami. But strong American and Cuban patrols, drug interdiction cooperation between the United States and Cuba is perhaps the highlight of the two countries' relations, prevent this flow from being more than small volumes smuggled in the holds of larger vessels or pleasure craft resulting in much higher overhead costs and much lower volumes per shipment. This route is a faint shadow of what it used to be in its Miami Vice heyday. Long gone are the days where small vessels packed to the gills with cocaine could simply sail into Miami Harbor or land in or near the Everglades. Plenty of South American drugs are still shipped by water and air toward the United States, just not all the way to the United States. Most make landfall in Central America or Southern Mexico before joining the cartel's landbound supply chains. But one of the quirks of narcotic economics is that the addicts at the point of sale are not particularly price sensitive. The American success at blocking maritime and air routes forced the drug flows into more expensive land routes. The sonar and low elevation radar that proved so effective at monitoring featuresless water and keeping illicit shipments away from American shores proved largely useless at sealing the 2,000-mile-long U.S.-Mexican border. And so the drug flow shifted from Miami Vice to something else. One of the many reasons that water transport is so much cheaper is that it is so much less complicated. There are no middlemen in the ocean, no towns to navigate, no regulatory agencies that make their homes on the waves. You leave port, you sail, you can sail around anything you don't like the look of, you enter port, and that is it. On land, there are physical borders to cross. You must follow existing infrastructure. You must deal with local regulations, customs, and law enforcement at a plethora of stops along the way. But all this adds more than simply cost. It also ensures that the shippers become intimately involved in every aspect of their transport routes. And should shippers using two different routes find themselves operating at the same bottleneck, say a mountain valley where their routes merge or an international border crossing, competition erupts. In the case of Mexico and drugs, these features generate two results. First, they drive up the cost of the cocaine that ultimately reaches the United States. While drug smugglers aren't exactly sticklers for filing statistical data, the Department of Justice estimates that the Mexican land portion of the cocaine smuggling routes adds about $10,000 to the cost of a kilo of cocaine, about $10 a gram, as compared to 1980s seaborne routes. That is a lot of money being used to employ, corrupt, bribe, and or heavily arm a great many people across the length and breadth of Mexico's many smuggling byways. The landbound nature of the smuggling routes introduces so many increases to the price of cocaine that it is all but inevitable that large, well-funded organizations will arise from the trade. Best guess is that the Mexican portion of the drug supply chain has an annual turnover in excess of $60 billion roughly 4-5% to 5 of Mexico's legal GDP. For comparison, the U.S. automotive industry comprises about 1.2% of U.S. GDP. The total sales of Walmart, America's largest corporation, are about 2.5%. Second, it also guarantees that these well-connected, well-funded organizations have a lot to fight over. We know that competition as the Mexican drug war or the cartel wars it pits the various cartels against one another, battling for control of key nodes throughout northern and southern Mexico, up to and including the major border crossings to the United States. Not just the drug war, but the very existence of the cartels themselves would have been impossible if American success in blocking maritime drug shipments had not forced the drug flows inland. A generation after Miami Vice, the cartels are doing what any major corporation that controls neither the source nor destination of its product would do. Diversify. First, diversify horizontally into similar industries in which their assets and skill sets are applicable. 
Things like robberies, cargo theft, and kidnappings are all now in the cartel's collective portfolio. Most notably, marijuana production and smuggling in Mexico were not part of most of the cartel's initial prerogatives. Now they are. Second, diversify up the supply chain to take over direct control of drug production. As of 2014, the cartels already de facto control most of the cocaine gathering and production networks in Peru and Bolivia, the largest and third largest sources of raw coca in the world. The cartels are even chewing away at the Colombian supply system. In a classic case of who do you cheer for, the cartels are going head to head with many of Colombia's infamous cocaine generating entities, up to and including the FARC. Third and most relevant to this discussion, the cartels are expanding down the supply chain. Long ago, the cartels mastered the craft of border crossings. Now they have taken the next logical steps and are getting into retail distribution in the major American cocaine and marijuana distribution hubs. Obviously, border communities such as San Diego, El Paso, and Brownsville were the first targeted, but the cartels are also painfully active in places as far from the border as New York City. A particularly aggressive effort is even underway in British Columbia to seize control of the Canadian province's marijuana network from the Hells Angels. The cartels have also been very successful in utilizing American public lands, especially in the California State and National Park system, to grow marijuana in large quantities closer to market, not to mention on the cleared side of American customs. Wherever the cartels go, they come into competition with local American crime networks, oftentimes intercity gangs, for control of the local distribution systems. But while the premeditated violence of America's local inner-city gangs is no joke, it pales compared to the casual violence of the transnational drug groups that were forged in the culture of the Mexican cartel wars. Add in superior weapons, weapons training, and control over the actual supply of the narcotics, and the Mexicans are rapidly overwhelming and in some cases co-opting their former American sales affiliates. Finally, there is the illegal immigration nexus. The cartels have found in each major American city one additional, critical ingredient that has allowed them to put down roots deeper and spread faster than they could in South America or even among their own countrymen. America's Hispanic ghettos. The American method for managing its illegal population has created a large community in each major city that lives outside the protection of local law enforcement and financial monitoring. The cops' patrols are less effective without the illegals' active participation. The Fed has no bank data to work from. The illegals speak the same language and often come from the same country as the cartel's frontmen. It is a community set up that is perfect for the cartels to recruit from and ultimately control. As with the value of drugs, data as to the size of cartel penetration into the United States is somewhat limited. But the Department of Justice estimates that as of 2013, the cartels are already active in over a thousand U.S. municipalities that include multitudes of communities in the greater Los Angeles, Dallas-Fort Worth, Houston, Atlanta, Kansas City, Denver, Chicago, Detroit, and Baltimore metro regions. The cartel's expansion into the United States proper is still in its early stages. So at present, their conflicts with American gangs are being swallowed up by the normal noise of gang-on-gang -gang violence. But in the not-too-distant future, the cartels will have easily won those battles. And if the cartels are willing to go to war with each other for transport routes through Mexico, it is difficult to imagine that they'll pull punches when attempting to secure the cash cow of American demand from each other. Scared New World something to be scared about. This is the point where I think I'm supposed to say something dramatic, like the drug war will be with us soon. Only that's not the point. The Mexican drug war has already expanded north of the border. It is no longer a question of prevention, but mitigation. I normally hesitate to suggest any courses of action. Geopolitical and demographic forces are so rooted in the unchangeable that political action often generates little but noise. But in this case, a course of action does present itself, even if that solution is politically problematic. Border security is, at best, a painfully expensive patch. The answer, I think, lies in legalization. Not of drugs, 
output of immigration. What studies I've examined indicate that legalizing illegal drugs is probably a financial wash. In most studies, any money saved in terms of law enforcement would most likely be lost in terms of higher health care costs and lost worker productivity. Additionally, most studies assume that a legal market for narcotics would eliminate the illegal market. Unfortunately, any legal regulated drug distribution system will have end costs higher than the black market, all but guaranteeing the black market's parallel existence, mitigating any cost savings. For soft drugs like marijuana, legalization might be a break-even proposition. But for hard drugs like cocaine, legalization would cause more problems, financial and otherwise, than it would solve. As regards the cartels, legalization provides some interesting possibilities. They battle each other over supplies and transport routes. And a legal supply and transport system is simply another source of competition to be addressed with their normal, brutal skill set. Colorado's and Washington's experiments with legalizing marijuana mean that they have volunteered to be case studies in a way I seriously doubt they have contemplated. Opening of the border with the issuance of worker and travel permits would with the speed of a printer transform America's Hispanic ghettos into areas where people have legitimate identification and store their money in banks like everyone else. Cooperation with police would no longer be perceived as a sharp negative and the Federal Reserve's anti-money laundering tools would suddenly have data to work with. Most of all, the cartels would lose their fertile rest and recruitment grounds north of the border. Legalization wouldn't solve everything, but it is the single biggest step that the United States could take. Should the Americans, however, choose to leave the border and the ghettos as is, they face the dawn of the most horrible conflict they have ever fought. Unlike Vietnam or Iraq, the next chapter of the drug war will be fought at home. More than China, more than Russia, more than Iran, it is expansion of the Mexican drug war to all of North America that is emerging as the single greatest geopolitical threat to the American way of life.